what everything we know about dark matter, we observe it through its gravitational signature. Now that might be a bit worrying. Because if you look at Einstein's equations, um, there's two sides to it. So dark matter explanation says that um, there's some forms of matter that contribute to this energy momentum tensor that gives rise to um, a, a gravitational signature that we observe to normal matter, bearing matter, etc. There's other explanation that says, oh, maybe it's not, you know, thinking with just baryons, and but there's something else in the gravity sector that um, makes us think there is such thing as dark matter. Um, and the issue is still not settled, although this side has many more problems than this side, and should have, of course, going to focus on the dark matter, dark matter explanation of this model. Three of the things we know about dark matter, uh, it's cold. So it doesn't need to go free streaming, it doesn't move much in the universe, so we come on this. Um, it's collisionless, so it doesn't transfer heat over a large distance, it doesn't thermalize, so we don't want this. And it's not attracting, it's neutral in the standard model, which so it doesn't re-interact with baryons and photons. So and this and these three conditions form what we call the cold dark matter paradigm, which has been extremely successful at explaining various cosmological and astrophysical observations. Starting with the cluster dynamic that you know Zwicky observed a um, long time ago, and you know the galaxy rotation curve, more recently the CMB has been um, due to some t very tight measurements of the, of the presence of dark matter, um, observation of galaxy distribution in the universe, it's totally consistent with the existence of cold dark matter, and observation of exotic objects just like um, the Willet cluster reinforce the fact that dark matter is really um, doesn't have much self-interaction. So we have this successful paradigm. Um, but of course, if that was the end of the story, we'll, you know, we'll be, I'll be out of a job and I could go home and read a book. But of course, this is not the end of the story. There are hints that there might be physics beyond cold dark matter. And this, so I'm going to talk about just two hints here. There, there are many more. Um, and of course, these are just hints. They're not, you know, definitive observation that has proved that cold dark matter is just wrong, but it's just, you know, little observation that makes you um, think about, you know, what lies beyond. Um, one of the, and two of these observations I mentioned today has, have to do with more galaxies orbiting in an old way, or actually for other galaxies too. Um, so the first, the first thing is this, this mass profile of these dwarf galaxies go towards vertical. Um, so so these galaxies have some, some mass profile for the dark matter is distributed inside, and you can go and measure these things. Uh, of course, these observations are very hard, but you can go and measure how the, the dynamics of how a star rotates and moves in these dwarfs variable. And from this observation, you can infer how matter, dark matter, is distributed inside. And then you can go and, and use a cold dark matter and make an end-body simulation uh, to compare with your and, uh, and the thing is, once you do a, a cold dark matter simulation, you obtain the dark matter inside these, these dwarf turtles should be quite cuspy uh, as, a, you know, as a density profile. While the observation suggests that it might just be a core, so you know, cold dark matter said, oh, we should have a cusp, so the slope, the, the mass function should be around here, and then you go and observe, and it's significantly different um, from what you expect from cold dark matter. Of course, this n body simulation not contain baryons, um, so there's this other issues you might, you might think of um, that might explain this, but it might also indicate that the dark, the dark matter is less simple and just cold, <coughs> cold dark matter. Uh, another observation from dwarf galaxies has been pointed out quite recently by Paul um, and Colchin, um, very recently, is that um, so in an n-body simulation, um, if you simulate like a galaxy Milky Way-like uh, the dark matter halos, and you look at the sub halo inside that halo, you realize that the most massive halos um, are way too dense to host a bright uh, dwarf spherical that we observe today among our own gas. So basically, if you plot, oh, this is where I'm missing the bottom, um, this is the velocity versus radius of these, these uh, dwarf galaxies, and, and so these bands uh, contain. Um, the sub halos you get from simulation. And then this large band here, which corresponds to the most massive sub halos, and we don't observe any 
of these most massive dwarfs original that are going to melt away in that band. So these are very massive halos which should have attracted baryon to them because they're so massive, and yet we don't observe them. So that's a problem with Daniel CD. And, that's, and, and this is harder to explain than this because you cannot like, you know, say, oh, it's a detection bias. We haven't seen these things. They're too fine. No, these, these others should be very bright because these should be the most massive and have the most damage. So this, this is a hard to explain. On average, oh. how many should the Milky Way have? Um, at least a few. You know, right. My hand. The thing is, basically, there's only one. Of the one we observed, there's only Draco is you know, mighty consistent with it. Right? I mean, if we put in two sigma or something. Is it really just a matter of the view? Because if you're not going to look at the bright rockets, you, you must be able to look at other galaxies as well. You mean, you mean like uh, the brighter dwarfs? Around, around other galaxies. Nice. Um, I'm not sure this analysis has been carried for other galaxies. I mean, this is a reason. This is like, you know, two, two, two months ago. Um, what people have shown, though, is that this can be relaxed very much if you, if you actually introduce interacting dark matter. And I'm going to talk about this. And that, you know, that's one of the motivation for um, atomic dark matter. So, yes? Do people trust CPM calculations enough for these types of statements? I mean, you mean pure, pure kind of uh, CDM uh, n-body simulation? Yeah, so, so in, the, in the second paper, they try, <coughs> these people try to say, okay, so what if we will include Baryon in the simulation if there's some wacky astrophysics that can give us this? And he concluded that, no. It's very hard to invoke uh, strange astrophysics to explain the kind of thing. Here, you could invoke strange astrophysics. One of the strange astrophysics is <coughs> just include Baryon in the simulation, and that might just move it. But here, this is much harder. Um, the last slide of motivation is about um, you know, the complexity of the standard model versus the dark side. Now we know from the standard model that it has a lot of structure, it has a, lots of particle, quarks mapped on, all the force carrier, you know, the gauge group structure, and et cetera. So there's you know, it's, it's a lot of uh, richness in it. Well, usually when we talk about the dark sector, we say there's a dark matter. It's like one particle, you know, like, like a whim, and that's it. You know, that, that forms dark matter part. Uh, dark matter side. Now, what, I mean, if you look at this, you compare these two, I mean, it, it, it seems to me that there's, there's so much structure here. Why does there be a lot of structure in the dark sector too? Um, so, in, in the model we're going to talk today, it's, you know, it's, it's an example, a kind of minimal example where you introduce new structure in the dark sector, and then you can see, you can ask the question, you know, is it consistent with cosmology, um, etc. And you know, how much? The question is, how much freedom do your current observation leave? for um, new structure in the dark sector, and, and in my answer to that is a fair amount. You can do quite a bit, and, and you have respect cosmology and astrophysics, etc. Now today we're gonna, we're gonna focus on this um, last model, so this is my, my personal desk of favorite dark matter candidate, and I'm gonna focus, about, I'm gonna focus on this last, uh, last category here, which is the inner sector bound state dark matter. Uh, so here's the outline of what we're gonna talk today, so I'm gonna briefly introduce this model called hidden charge dark matter, which form the basis of what I'm going to talk about and, and talk about its strength. Then I'm going to introduce the actual model that I'm going to talk today, so the atomic dark matter. And I'm going to discuss its thermal history, its evolution of its ionization fractions, maybe decoupling, which is very important for structure formation. I'm going to discuss some constraints from cosmology, amount of bias spectrum, because my part of my query background. I'm going to conclude with some astrophysical constraints of the model, which are turns out to be very important. And we'll mention some pure directions for um, this sort of model. Now, I'll, now I'll just <coughs> briefly mention this hidden charge dark matter. So, hidden charge dark matter was a model that was proposed a long time ago, but kind of recycled recently by Jonathan Fang et al. and also by some other people like Altec. Um, and it's basically you have, you have this, this dark matter particle which is charged under a, a, a hidden one. So it's a U1 that doesn't interact at all with the standard model. It's just it's purely on the dark sector. And you ask the question, you know, given the astrophysical observation we have today, is this model, model viable and these people uh, went and done the constraint, and this is, so this is the mass axis, this is the equivalent of the fine structure constant, this is the U1, so this is the fine structure constant in this model. 
and you realize that given concern the bullet clusters are and the ellipticity of dark matter halos, because we observe this dark matter halos to be a triaxial triaxial shape, so do you not fully terminalize. So that is constrained on this this kind of model. And you realize that only this corner of parameter space here is viable in the model. So these models are basically interacting dark matter because they're charged as particles pass each other, you have some kind of uh, Coulomb interaction basically. And this kind of ruled out all the historic parameter space because suddenly you start having interacting dark matter and you start making your, uh, your dark matter held very round. Now, what we're going to talk about today is actually atomic dark matter. And atomic dark matter lies in this corner of parameter space where alpha is strong enough for these charged particles to actually bound together in a bound state. And the mass needs to be low enough that, that uh, the number density is high enough that these particles can meet each other to actually form mass. So in this upper very parameter space, um, you're going to form bound state, neutral bound states, which then change these constraints because now dark matter won't be charged anymore, it will be a neutral bound state. So now, now our goal is we want to see how much we do this, this block change once you take into account that in this upper corner we actually form uh, atoms. So here we go. Uh, atomic dark matter. Um, this model actually, if you go back to the literature, was also introduced in 1986. Um, and it was uh, called the shadow hydrogen at the time. Uh, it's been forgotten and then was recently did, uh, last year by David Kaplan. Um, it's basically it's a simple model. You have a, you postulate uh, a U1 gauge force, just like a dark photons, and you have two fermions that have opposite charge. And for obvious reason, we're going to call it dark electron and dark proton. Um, these two things interact uh, Coulomb-like interaction. Um, there's as many electrons as protons, so this is neutral. There's no long-range force, no wacky uh, cosmology is happening here. Um, you only you only need four parameters to try to model the fine structure constant, the binding energy of the mass, the electron and proton, the mass of the dark matter, and the temperature of the dark proton which is usually param parameterized by the C, which is the ratio of this dark sector to the standard model temperature, which is basically the CAD temperature today. Uh, and this, these parameters are subject to this constraint which enter the proton mass is real, you know, imaginary, because B is a derived quantity, basically. Um, as I'm mentioning, this, this atomic dark matter has a rich thermal history, so we're going to spend some time talking about it, because this is really what we care about for cosmology, we really care about um, the different state of this, uh, these dark atoms. So the early, early universe, just like regular baryonic matter, everything is ionized, everything is strongly attracting, uh, so it forms really this hot plasma. Uh, and the dark are in a tidy couple to the dark radiation uh, most perfect world. Uh, as time goes on and the dark subject cools down due to the expansion of the universe, two important processes that happen. First is recombination. Once the temperature of the dark sector falls below the, the binding energy, um, dark, it becomes energy, energy, you know, the energy thing is, is, um, works towards forming bound states um, in the dark sector. And the other process is kinetic and thermal decoupling between proton, dark photons and, and uh, dark uh, electrons and protons. So when the interaction rate between dark matter and this dark radiation falls below the whole rate, um, this dark matter temperature decouples from uh, the radiation and causes the radical. So we, we, we spend a lot of time describing these two processes in detail. Of course, the nice thing about this is that this is very similar to normal hydrogen, so we have a lot of intuition about how everything works, so it makes our life uh, quite a bit simpler, at least in some corner of parameter space. Um, now this is this is a model which is not completely free. We, we know um, you know, it needs to be to a group of cosmology, and, and it's in particular you, need, you don't want to uh, mess up with the big bang nucleosynthesis, which puts an upper bound on the number of uh, relativistic species uh, during this PDN. And the constraint is something like this, and once you, you work out the math, you find that the temperature in the dark sector should be about, at, at most, three quarters of the standard model temperature. So it needs to be a bit colder. Um, than this, than this if you have dark photons rolling around today, it's going to be a bit colder than this human. So that you don't produce too much helium in the early universe and so on. Now, uh, just started briefly to recombination. Um, just like for regular hydrogen recombination, 
Uh, it cannot happen by this directly recombining with the ground state of the ion atom because once you do that, you emit a very energetic photon that goes and just ionizes other atoms. That's very inefficient. So what you do is you consider case B recombination, which recombine to the second excited state and then cascade down to the first excited state. Well, then the first the ground Sorry, the, I Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, this, this constraint on the temperature is not affecting your freeze out of obviously, right? I mean, you're, the freeze out you're still saying it's just normal radiation uh, making the dark matter particles itself freeze out. Mm -hmm. You're not uh, supporting any, any strong uh, photon coming uh, in the production of the dark matter itself. No, I, I'm just yeah. asking. It, it's, it's quite, quite sad. So, um, so the number of charged particles in the, in the plasma is governed by the Boltzmann equation for the ionization fraction, where I define this as the number of free electrons with the total number of protons plus dark, uh, neutral dark matter particle. This is a normal equation you're going to solve for um, regular hydrogen. Um, this is nothing new here. This pre factor encodes <laughs> the fact you, you recombine to n equal two states. And once you recombine to n equal two states, it can either be ionized again by uh, a lamin alpha proton, basically. Or you can combine to the ground state by emitting uh, by emitting a lamin alpha proton or um, a, two, a, a suppressed two proton process, and so that that encodes the probability of all these these different processes. And so everything else is described here. So this is this is very standard for this is just like regular hydrogen recombination. Um, one thing that's a bit different though it's so uh, this recombination coefficient which basically govern the rate of recombination. Um, it, in previous studies of dark atom, people have used this kind of can canonical recombination rate that you can find it in the Spitzer set textbook. Uh, so there's, there's a few problems with, with this rate. Um, first, it, it, it only depends on the dark matter temperature, so it misses the dependence on the radiation temperature. The thing is, uh, when you there's two processes for recombining: it's spontaneous recombination, it's stimulated recombination. It's a quantum process with the on photons. So this this rate actually has a, a dark uh, radiation dependence, although it's, it's not there, so we would like, would like to include this. It also miss all the effects from the ion states, all the, the tail, um, the ion shells that are included in this. And the temperature dependence from, from very low temperature and very high temperature is not fully captured. So what we do, well, it's, 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 it's easy. Um, we just go in and compute these rates from scratch. Um, you know, these rates are, are, are well tabulated. Um, this is all atomic cross section has been worked out in the, in the 1940s, 1950s. So you can go on and find it and then compute these, put these thermal arrays from scratch. And we use this uh, method devised by uh, Yasin and Yamur, uh, the post like IS now, uh, where you actually include all the possible uh, bound bound transition. Um, so we basically capture this ion state effects for free in the way. So we, we do that, compute these rates. So, so this is completely under control. Um, and then you can ask, well, okay, once you do that, like, does it make any difference at all? Um, in the case where you're in thermal equilibrium, which dark matter is basically the same temperature as photons, um, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Um, you know, this green line is the rate by, by Spitzer, and you know, this little difference here that is about 40%, and that's, you know, the sure factor with right fast, it's the, the 1.4 to the fourth factor you need to multiply your rates to get into account the ion states. Otherwise, uh, this Picino at all, this is the rate that breakfast uses. It's, it's very good over most of the range of recognition happening. As I was saying, at early times and a bit of late times, um, the chemical where you can fail. Now, for usual hydrogen, this doesn't matter because everything is ionized all the way up here. But um, as we will see, um, this becomes important if uh, company heating is inefficient at early times. So we, so I think, Capturing this behavior right here is going to be important for later, uh, for later studies. Now, um, if, the if the thermal decoupling happens before recombination, then the, the temperature difference between the radiation and the dark matter becomes important. And then their usual approach can fail. And, and then it becomes important to actually calculate these rates exactly. And this is what we, what we do. So then we can capture all the spontaneous, uh, the stimulated recombination accurately. And um, so all these rates are in control. Now, once you go on and integrate your Boltzmann equation, in the strong open case, which is basically where the matter temperature just follows the radiation temperature, I mean, it's just, 
it changed very little. I mean, this is basically 10 percent different in the end, and that's because most of the radiation, the recombination process happens in equilibrium, where um, where basically the saw approximation is completely valid, and the actual value of the recombination rate doesn't matter. But in the weak coupling case, it makes a huge difference. I mean, this is like an order of magnitude in ionization fraction. I'm comparing, you see the, here the standard treatment or the improved, treat, the improved treatment I described. And we see that for the weak coupling case, when alpha is quite small, you can actually have a little difference. I mean, you, a lot of difference. I mean, you, you kind of miss the recombination ratio. Um, the length of ionization fraction is you know, an order of magnitude apart. So computing these things accurately makes, it makes a huge difference. So, so recombination is series under control. Now, thermal decoupling. So, when the temperature of the, the dark matter the radiation start to decouple, so when you describe the transition accurately, um, in, the early, in the early universe, you have all these collisions between dark photons and dark fermions, and basically the whole thing is thermal equilibrium, at, thermal equilibrium at a single temperature. But once this thermalization rate falls below or becomes the same order of magnitude as the Hubble rate, then the dark matter starts cooling theoretically. And why do we care so much about this transition? Well, it's because, as I said, the recombination theory is quite sensitive to the temperature of the radiation and the dark matter. And even more importantly is the kinetic decoupling, which kind of tells you well, what's the smallest dark matter hell we can form at any time, um, is also determined by this process. So we need, we need to be able to capture this uh, quite accurately. accurately. So um, in the early universe, for strong coupling, when alpha is big enough, the, the, the most important mechanism to exchange energy between radiation and, and the dark uh, fermions is just Compton scattering. Just like for regular baryonic hydrogen. It's Compton, Compton heating is the most important mechanism, and that, that's basically determine the temperature. Um, and for, so this is, you know, the photons hit the dark electrons, give some energy, and so that's, that's the process we care about. And for all interesting cases, Coulomb scattering between dark electron and dark fermions maintain them at the same temperature. Coulomb scattering is always extremely efficient. Now, the problem is that in the weak coupling case, when alpha is quite small or the dark structure is quite cold, coupling heating is inefficient. So now you start deviating from the regular like baryonic hydrogen case, and you need to work a bit harder to think about, okay, what's really going on when coupling heating is inefficient at early times. Now, that means that you need to include some other mechanisms beyond company heating, and these are the boundary processes, as far as the photonization heating and the function of cooling. Uh, we also include free for heating and free for cooling, um, and I think it's this kind of scaling between these rates, and this is the content heating rate, which is t to the fourth, and these are t squared to the five and a half, so they all have, all have different temperature dependence, which means that for different values and parameters, some of these rates become more important, than others, and I will show a couple examples in a second. And at the end of the day, this is an equation you need to solve to get to actually solve the matter temperature. This is a constant heating term, which is going to be fine for regular life. This is just a uh, idea cooling from the expansion universe. And these are all the, these are, uh, are the new processes, these, these ones, that we now include in our analysis to better, better capture the energy, energy transfer between the dark, sec the dark photon sector and the dark matter sector. Now, in such strong of case, I was saying, uh, Coupling heating is the most efficient, so here I'm plotting the different thermal rates as I mentioned in a redshift. Uh, the black line is Compton heating for the strong coupling case. We see Compton heating is just efficient compared to all the other, the other rates. So, you know, we just use coupling heating. If you're done, that pretty determines your temperature. So, for small alpha D, basically there's a deterministic relation between V, D, and MD. It's just alpha squared MD. Uh, you wouldn't have alpha squared MD. Yeah, so. So it's just a choice of parameter. You, I could have chosen the, the, the mass of the two fermions, but well, you, can, you can just invert Well, them. I mean, assuming that one is much less massive than the other, yes. then you... That's right. Then you just face... Well... But you, I mean, because within, you don't within, have... Within factors of two, it's just the lower mass fermion. That's so, right. That, that's so right. then within factors of two, B, B is basically uh, alpha squared times N. And that's right. That's right, yeah. So then you really have two parameters to vary the output from the That's right. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, I'll, I'll be constrained by the minute show it's going to be always the output you can send. Sorry. So is, yep. is that value of BD already basically ruled out? Uh, which one? Uh, 50 easy. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. I mean, yeah. So, so these plots are already for illustrative 
performance of that. I'll show the real tensor in the end. I mean, I, I could have put this to be down to like 500 KUG or something. But the thing is, you just, you just put everything to much larger redshift. So we're just taking this graph, <coughs> pushing everything to higher redshift. So uh, just for numerical purposes, it's much easier to put it this way. Um, so as mentioned, in the weak coupling case, so in the weak coupling case, when alpha starts starts low, then the green line, which is this photo recombination cooling, is dominant. So the content heating is black line is this is below, and you can basically forget about it. Um, so that changed the thermal history quite a bit because you know if you set, just if you would have considered only constant heating, you would have obtained so this is red line here that start diverging to the green line. The green line is the, the radiation temperature at a much earlier time than if you would take into account this uh, photo recombination cooling and photo ionization heating. So basically, this boundary rate maintains thermal contact much longer than you would have thought by just using them. And, and then, you know, it changes the temperature evolution, the temperature evolution quite a bit, and then back reacts and ionization fraction, as this is the same plot I showed you before, for the weak oven case. So, so it's important to, to include these extra ingredients to get um, a good idea what the, the late time ionization fraction is, because that's going to be because this you, you're going to use astrophysics constraint at, at later times. Now, if we just put all the pieces together, um, say if you want to one day you want to work in dark atom, you want to know if you need to work hard or no, you can just use people regular hydrogen recombination. But that's that's the number you want to compute. So um, the standard standard treatment of recombination, as described in Keeble and others, works as long as this epsilon, which is defined as this, is larger than one. If this is smaller than one, the standard treatment does not apply. And this is, uh, I'm putting the log of alpha versus the log of the, the mass, but different values of the ratio of the dark sector temperature to standard model temperature. And it, as, as is my guess, you know, it's, it's always the, the low low alpha, low mass region that you need to work harder. Because this, this, this corresponds to denser, um, Denser dark matter, uh, and it's a dark matter gas, and you know, also a more weakly double so that comes in heating is the uh, So that's the number you want, you want to compute, and as the colder is your dark sector, the more you need to work. It is because Compton heating depends on, on T to the 4, and, it, and so it depends on C to the 4, and C is very small, you suppress Compton heating by a lot. Um, okay, so, so now we have the thermal history and the control, so we, we can solve for it and know what it is. Now we can start sometimes with this actual cosmology with this. Um, and we want to solve all perturbation involved in this background that we just solved for. And so we have the dark matter evolution equation. Here I'm using the notation of Martin Berchinger, if you're familiar with this, but um, it's just, you know, delta is basically the dark matter over density, uh, theta is the divergent the velocity, and the h is the uh, Potential and uh, synchronous gauge, gravitational potential, synchronous gauge. And so basically, if you look at these equations, um, if you tell me you're in the case of the baryon, it's exactly the equation for baryon coupled to regular photons. And because now dark matter, since it's charged by you want to be able to be out of that. Um, and I also wrote down the, the dark photon equation, which is the same, the same thing as the regular photon equation. Now, this term is an important term. Does that term correspond to momentum transfer between the photon sector and the dark matter sector? Um, and if, if this coefficient here is large, then that forces this two things to be the same, which means that the dark matter basically just carried along by these dark photons. It doesn't behave itself. And the photons, if you solve their equation, it just oscillate. So we have this photon over density oscillation, and the dark matter is just dragged along. Uh, we'll show in a minute some plot of what that looks like in practice, but so when this coefficient falls, becomes order one, this is when kinetic decoupling happens. And kinetic decoupling happens when dark matter is, is, able, is able to move freely off the dark photon, so it doesn't interact much with the dark photon anymore. Yeah, question? Okay. Um, and this, so, so the moment when this happens, because as long as the dark matter and the dark photon are coupled, Structure cannot grow. It just uh, can smooth out structure up to up to the, the scale that happens to arise in the decoupling. And, and that determines the smallest dark matter halo uh, that you're going to have at later time. 
So this, the, the time between the couple is very important. And that's going to depend on the parameter of the model. Uh, yes? Um, I mean, you showed that kinetically uh, the recombination for the optimization is important. Yeah. So in some sense, it should be important for the momentum as well. Yeah, it is. So, so are you including it then? Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah, there, there are actually there are two terms. Okay. Actually, so this, is, one. this is here. Here. All right. So there's a. So okay, this, this, <laughs> this opacity, this opacity, which is this finds the inverse of this uh, main free path, has two terms. This is the usual Compton term, which just corresponds to you know how much a dark matter or dark photon can move before hitting and, uh, a dark fermion, and then there's another term, which is how much how much longer, how much what's this and the dark photon can move before hitting uh, an actual neutral atom. And, and one thing I. I mean, the recombination can depend on the uh, square process, so it's x e squared. That's right. I'm kind of sort of surprised that x e squared, especially the Greek cocktail, yeah. where there's already you know, a, a percent or so, that that is still winning in terms of the parameters uh, over the x e process. I mean, uh, I mean is, 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 what you thought you were talking about? The x e Yeah, where well, you showed the cooling rates, basically. Oh, the cooling, yeah. yeah. So, so the x e squared process. So just because the amplitude Yeah, but as soon as the combination happened, it becomes very suppressed and it draws a trimmy. But it was still it was still not a higher flow. Uh, uh, I don't know, I can I can I can show it again, but I, I thought here, uh, the the you know now three of here. Yeah, but as soon as the combination happened, it just rapidly draws. Yeah, but I mean this is the the, the combination is X E, right? Uh, and the other one is X E square. Uh, I mean yeah. So it, it does drop, but not, not as much, right? I mean, I can, even in the, the, the other case, let me see the other case, right? So, so company heating, this company heating drops, but the company, the, company, uh, the photo energy can drop quite as much, like XD squared. So you really, really see it. So, okay. All right, so, um, so there's different regimes I want to talk about. So there's two terms in its opacity. There's another different regime for our modes. Perturbation evolves over time. Um, so when perturbation inside the horizon, there's nothing, nothing is happening. So we can forget about this. Now, as perturbation enters the horizon, this funky dark matter, dark radiation plasma, um, as long as the, the, the momentum transfer rate is even like this, where so R is this ratio of photons to dark matter energy density. Um, as long as this is much larger than the, the mode you're looking at, then it's a strong coupling regime. And you have undamped acoustic oscillation. You have this, this acoustic wave oscillating inside the horizon with not much damping. Now, as the frequency of the photons become higher than this momentum transfer rate, then you, you end up with an acoustic damping regime. So these photons are oscillating very fast, but the, the, there's not enough momentum transfer to actually transfer this momentum to dark, dark matter. So in dark matter, it expresses on the drag, and that's damped perturbation on these scales. And finally, um, when this momentum transfer rate falls below the L rate, there's no more coupling, and dark photons can free stream away, and dark matter can start, the perturbation can start growing, just like regular cold dark matter. Now, that, that's, that's the specific example of what I'm talking about. So this strong coupling regime, again, the momentum transfer rate is much larger, it's larger than the L rate, and uh, the frequency of the photons. Now, the into the horizon and start oscillating with the photons. The green line is, is the dark matter. Uh, the red is the dark radiation, which just follow each other until dark, um, until dark recombination, where the photons move away and dark matter can start growing, just like cold dark matter, but from a reduced amplitude. And that reduced amplitude is due to two things. During a radiation domination, which is here, it doesn't experience the logarithmic, the logarithmic uh, growth. Uh, so it misses on this. It also misses the horizon kick once the mode did arise. So the difference between these two curves, between the cold dark matter curve and the atomic dark matter curve, is only due to these two processes. There's, not, there's no damping, interesting damping going on. Now, for mode into the horizon before, a bit, a bit later, the os so again, the into the horizon started oscillating with the photons for a long time. It's a bit of a bit of damping as much of time. And then when when you enter this weak coupling regime, suddenly the, the, the dark matter cannot follow the photons anymore. 
maybe that it doesn't interact strongly enough with it. And then that kind of tends to damp the dark matter in a perturbation way. The photon is smoothed out on one thing, and then it can start drawing again for a bunch of much, much reducing amplitude. So, so, the, so the, I guess it damping the suppressed power on the small scale. So you should have no structure at any time at this point. And if you, you enter the rise in the weak of the regime, again, with the Momentum transfer rate is much smaller than the, the frequency of the photon. You just start, you start oscillating, but the damping kills you right away, and you start uh, again drawing the late after decoupling, but from a much reduced So this is a different kind of scenario uh, that that happens now. If you you know integrate this to like time to compute the matter part spectrum today, so how matter is used in the universe. Uh, of course, a large scale is the is like cold dark matter, but then this is DAO regime. So DAO is like DAO, this dark matter thick oscillation, because it's dark matter coupled to this plasma. You have this regime where you have on damp oscillation, and then you have this damping tail here. Um, and this is the important thing that this, this cutoff, the low, the low width of power is reduced. And getting this cutoff right is it's important because it basically tells you what's the minimum mass. Of of like a dark matter halo, we're going to get a um, This is for the strong coupling case, so we have a long regime of uh, undamped oscillation. In a weak coupling case, you only have few oscillation and they rapidly go. Again, you get a cutoff, but if the DIO regime is, uh, is, is quite surprised. But this is the kind of thing we look at. Um, yeah, and then the thing, so if you, if you look at what kind of data we have in the matter power spectrum, the linear matter power spectrum, and we have data from in the line and alpha forest and so on, all the way to about here, so if there's such a model with these parameters, clearly ruled out, um, and it's clear you need to push this cutoff to much larger scale. Now, if you do that, um, it's not clear how you can be able to observe this, because you push everything to a small astrophysical scale, where it's hard to see. Um, and you did, so the scalar scale is defined as the mode and the horizon where we can do the coupling. And you can just you know, make a simple spherical collapse argument how this cutoff momentum is related to the minimum halo mass. It's kind of, you know, spherical argument like this. And this, you know, considering the dwarf galaxies exist, so you have you know, a mass of 10 to the 6 solar mass and 7 solar mass, you, you have k cut should be at least 200 and goes the parts. So that's this kind of the lower, lowest bound you can imagine having for these models. Uh, I guess this is, this is very hard to observe, but it's not homeless. And actually involved with two, uh, a mission to actually go and number, observe these things. So, and the way, the way you want to do this, is basically you want to observe the Zerman substructure using stronger, stronger general engine. So the setup is, so it's a little aside, it's going to take about two minutes here. Um, so you have this galaxy. Um, that, that, that's lensing a background quasar, a hypercheck quasar, and it's lensing with multiple images. And so you see it today, it looks like this, on uh, this. And then if you have precise measurements of these four images for um, the time delays, the position, and the magnification of this image, you can actually reconstruct the, the gravitational potential, the projected gravitational potential inside that lens, that galaxy here, and can infer properties um, about, about the dark matter substructure inside, and in particular, you, you're most sensitive to that, that cutoff in the, in, the, in the mass function. So it's not hopeless that we won't be that we'll be able to measure actually that, uh, that kind of mass cutoff that this kind of dark matter uh, atomic diamond model uh, predicts. And you know we have uh, you know emission and flight system and everything planned. And you guys in the area from Staka, so. I'm deeply involved in this. Who is this being uh, proposed to? It was proposed for Explorer 2011. Uh, it was category two, which is this short category one. It's too bad. Uh, next, next call is 2015, the next Explorer mission. Um, the thing is the analysis to actually extract um, from these kind of images, properly the dark matter halo is still something that needs to be convincingly done, and that's that's actually something. I'm, this is what I'm doing with that level. Well. So if, if one inputs a funky power spectrum to a CBM simulation, does one notice anything in the halo mass distribution? 
that the that you extract is well, such a variable? I'm thinking just to not about the uh, measurement using an indirect uh, method like this, but just in the numerical simulation. Okay. I put in the bulky, yeah. bulky power spec, but I get everything noticeable in the mass. Well, that's something that's, it's, it's, uh, to, to my knowledge, never been done. So I, I, I don't know. It's actually, this part of the future work. Like how, you know, if you have this DAO regime, you have bumps in the power factor. How does that nonlinear physics basically takes this and modify it? So how does it look at the same time? So I, I don't know, because I mean, if you just have the CDM, you know, if you take into account nonlinear physics, you get this enhancement on a small scale. And it's likely that something like this is going to happen, but it's not clear if it's going to, is it going to just average out of these bumps? Or is it going to amplify them? So it, it hasn't been done. Uh, and and uh, to my knowledge, nobody actually attempted attempt it. Um, in the remaining few minutes, I'll talk about some constraint on uh, atomic dark matter. First one I'm going to mention uh, is, you know, what, what can what can we tell with this absurdly cosmic microwave background? And this is more or less interesting because the largest effect in CMB of, of this model it is the fact that we have extra radiation. Having extra radiation tend to shift matter radiation quality, the same it does change the size of the sound horizon and so on. So it tends to shift all the peaks, acoustic peaks of CME to the right, so towards smaller scales. Um, that's, that's by far the, uh, the, the largest effects that you can get in the CMB. And um, secondary effect you get is since dark matter in these models is, is interacting, so we also it contributes the pressure wave. Usually dark matter only contributes to you know, basically the incoming wave, you know, because it doesn't have, usually it doesn't have CN, it doesn't have pressure, so it doesn't contribute to the extension wave. But in that case, it contributes a bit. That changed the, the ratio of the odds and the peaks. So it can suppress the odd peaks compared to the peaks. But that's, that's a very small signal. Right? You know, so there's not much CMB you can do with CMB, although, as I'm talking again this morning, uh, spectral distortion might be something uh, interesting to do. Um, at a later time. Another, another constraint, um, which is very serious, um, is, is from astrophysics and I'm looking at dark matter halos and their shape. Um, so now we have a, we see a model where dark matter is actually interacting. Because so yeah, these atoms can bounce into each other, excite themselves, etc. And you have some residual ionization that can lead also to some interaction. So we need to be careful so that we don't Start changing the shape of your dark matter halos, uh, cluster scale, galactic scale, etc. And so you don't want basically you don't want to terminalize the A terminal halo is basically a big round sphere, and you don't want to create that, and that's not what we observe. But we came from the extra image of the halos, etc. And and that that leads to a constraint. Basically, you want the terminalization time, which is just you know simply given by you know, the, the number density inside these halos, and some kind of collision cross action to be less in the valuable time of these uh, cluster or galaxy, et cetera. And, and if you do a you know, simple estimate of the you know, ge geometry cross-section with these atoms, the bounce of each other, which is really like, you know, like a very crude estimate, but it should be, you, you know, give you the right order of magnitude. You get some constraint that looks like this. So it favors small alpha, I mass, and I binding energy. Now, um, for your own um, enjoyment, I've, I've made some plots what this looks like, but different values of binding energy. So uh, ranging from 10 eV to 1 MeV, uh, 100 eV to 1 MeV. And basically, the allowed region that the balance I just showed you is this purple triangle here in all these plots. Now, as I was mentioning, there's only, there's only this other corner of crowded space where actually dark atomic dark matter exists. In this lower, bit, this, this lower end, basically no atoms form because they're too weakly coupled. And the mass is too high, the number density is too low, these, these things never find each other. So it's clear that if the bonding energy is 100 dB or less, I mean, at, so remember, atomic dark matter only lives above this, this red line here. Um, basically, there's, there's, there's no parameter space for that. Now, as we increase the bonding energy, um, it becomes starting having some allowed region. Now, I should say, so this is everything below this blue line here is a concern that I'll show you. This other purple line here is this consistency constraint the binding energy I showed at the beginning. You know, binding energy can be anything during a show of alpha and m. 
they need to be to say the total mass of the imaginary, etc. So, so this is this is the LR region, and as you increase the binding energy, you open more and more parameter space. Um, so it's clear that uh, the binding energy needs to be quite large compared to rigid hydrogen for these things to be viable uh, astrophysically. And um, and you know alpha alpha needs to be quite you know quite large. Uh, you know it can it cannot be like very very ten to minus six. It needs to be ten to minus two. Well, if you think that alpha is one over logarithm, it can't be very small. Either. Is there a motivation for considering the microwave motivation considering smaller alphas than one over logarithm? I I I don't think. I mean, it's, it's just that if you have very small alpha, you just, I mean, to me, it was a it's, it's not an atomic dark matter. Right? I mean, it's this already my talk. But it, you know, it's not even my talk. Right? So it, it's just it just really it didn't charge dark matter, which I've already been discussing on other papers about the world. And these kinds of things didn't work out. So what we really care about is this region, this upper region where actually atomic dark matter can exist. Um, and that, that gives you a read that the thing that's the least things are quite constrained. You don't have a lot of free astrophysics. Um, control these things quite carefully. Uh, so the key points, so a few key points about atomic dark matter just to wrap up. So um, to me, atomic dark matter is a simple, effective test of the physics beyond the sun, uh, cold dark matter. And it basically, as you see, as a, as a minimal extension where you introduce some interaction in the dark sector, but these are quite minimal. And it's simple enough that you can play around with it and make some clear prediction towards the model. And you can you know, you use it as a toy model study more general dark sector with more interaction. Um, it retains the success of cold dark matter with cosmological scale, so you don't, you don't mess up cosmology too much, but you just change physics on very small scale, it's, uh, at, you know, inside more galaxies or galactic scale and so on. But you leave the large scales alone, which is what you need. Um, as I said, it has a rich journal history, um, can be covering this delay compared to typical winds, which means that power on small scale is suppressed, uh, compared to a typical WIMP. Uh, it makes easy to get more predictions, like a cutoff, it's easy DAOs, and uh, during the last one, it's not ruled out for two regions, although it's quite constrained. And so which kind of future direction you could go uh, with this, this, this type of dark matter model? Well, um, so these, these uh, this dark matter model has in internal structure, so this, you can excite it, so excited state, you have the dark photon, so you have a cooling mechanism. So that's an, that concerns your model too. I haven't, I haven't talked about this today, but um, you don't, you know, we observe dark matter halos to be, um, you know, quite large. If you have, you shouldn't have cooled too much. That's what it constraint. Of course, the blood cluster uh, puts a constraint because it's interacting with dark matter. Um, another question I could ask, you know, detectable, which, um, which is the point I made before about including on and nonlinear physics um, and then the DO regime. Um, people, a lot of people have worked into connecting this with standard model and sending direct detection signal. There's a, a quite a few papers on that. Um, you know, it's all these warp galaxy physics, um, concerning the problems I mentioned in the beginning, can atomic diagram solve these problems. Of course, there's a alien one in you know, a dark chemistry, can form molecular dark region, etc. So this is something you, you might consider, and um, it's related to this, these war galaxies. How does atomic dark matter behave when the first object collapses into uh, dark matter halos? Something that's not, not being worked out. And so this, this is a lot of exciting direction for this model, and um, well, I'll, I'll stop here. But I think to form dark star, you need a lot of cooling, right? So you need to be able to cool your gas to, to form a very like, kind of tightly bound object. And I'm not sure, I mean, that's, that's going to violate other constraints in dark matter. I mean, you observe big galactic halos, um, galaxy clusters. So now you will need to come up with a mechanism that leaves the halo alone, and, and it still gives you enough cooling to form dark star. So it's unlikely that's going to happen, just because you need a lot of cooling.
question? Well, you know, just, just under some basic points. So I suppose alpha P is very big. Okay. Yeah. So then the um, dark matter we combine is all the universe is still called Um, You can't push so, all the way there. So then by the time matter starts to want to cluster, uh, the temperature is way below the um, excitation the um, ionization energy of the dark matter atoms, and so they're effectively um, you know, billiard balls. Yep. Okay. But cross section can't be very big, or they would uh, they would uh, be strongly pushing them, right? And, and so you very strong limits in the cross section compared with an atomic cross section based on the dark matter profiles and place locations. Right? So doesn't that necessarily then push you if you have a large proper pump? Because it's, it's how much more even smaller than constant. You know, it doesn't mean you're running a couple of constants than your bike yeah. doesn't, doesn't that push you then with very large dark matter and, you know, particle masses and especially the lower of the two masses? Uh. Well, it, it, it does in a sense. I mean, in a sense, you could have like the most the model that would fit all observation would be like this a strongly bound dark matter, you know, like and strongly like a like strong core, basically. Because that that's basically you're going to form these bound states, and there's no way you can ever excite them. It just looks like cold dark matter from early on. And that's it. Okay. This is, you know, but, but, but the thing is, we didn't want to go into this direction because it, it just looks like cold dark matter. Already oh, well, wait a minute. I mean, um, if I just consider the atomic cross section, it's yeah. not negligible. No, no, I have a particle of the GED, but alpha of, say, uh, 0.1 or 0.3. Yeah. Uh, that atomic cross section is probably ruled out, I would think, based on. But I, I, so I, I showed yeah. you this, these, these, from, these plot, right? From. Uh, the thing is, you have, you have a large enough mass, you dilute, since you have a fixed dark matter density, because it's fixed for observation, mm -hmm. if you crank up the mass to 100 GED, then you have very few of these objects around. So even though the cross section is dark, you basically never find each other. Right, right. But you have to push up the mass. Yeah. And so and, and that's explained the shape of these uh, the, the, uh, these plots. Right? Well, the other thing in these plots, you were taking the slight independent variable from uh, well, it just, it just, so it, from alpha D and M D, which isn't really justified. Right? Um, but it's just a simple one. No, no, but no, but, but, but the constraint of I'm saying it's just for, for a given choice of alpha D and MD, you have, you have a bunch of choice of uh, binding energy. You have a certain range that's allowed for a given choice of these two. And that's what it is showing. So right. is, is, is MD, below this, it doesn't, atom doesn't make sense. Is, is MD the reduced mass? Or is it's it, a total mass of mass. It's a total mass. It's a total mass of mass. So it's like the equivalent of mass of mass. OK, sorry. Yeah, that, that's that the, 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 the is an infinite variable. It's, it's, the the thing that determines the number and so maybe I didn't make any mistakes. I guess we should probably stop here and go up for our cookies. And yeah, we will uh, make time to stop for dinner tonight and do everyone's time. Um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be here for a couple more days. Yeah, uh, I will. Yeah, I was about to say. Oh, sorry, I feel Wednesday. Yeah.